showtime! Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm Brent Holland, and welcome to Night Fright. And I think it just died on us. Are you there? I'm here. Oh, good. I'm here, too. Although, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, settle in tonight. We've got a great ride for you. But I want to warn you at the very beginning, this is not going to be a show for the faint of heart. This is going to be a show about serial killers, in specific Canadian serial killers. And everybody thinks Canada is kind of this boring, complacent place. Nothing could be further from the truth. Let me start off with this. Our show begins tonight with this true story from Canada. You just arrive home at the last minute and you kick off your shoes to relax. It's time to feed the cats. One of your two cats isn't around, so you go downstairs to the darkened basement, looking for it. There, you finally spot your cat near your furnace, but the cat is staring up towards the ceiling. You stare into the shadow, and standing there is a tall man with a mask covering his face. He leaps at you, and beats you again and again and again and again. The blows thundering down on your head. You fight back, hands flailing at anything and everything, knowing you are fighting to live. A blow to your head renders you dizzy and semi-conscious. You collapse into a heap on the freezing cement basement floor. Is this death? You will never be married? You will never have children? You will never laugh again. The blood's pouring down your face. The smell sickens you. Is this really happening? It can't be. But it is not over. The dark figure tapes your mouth and zip ties your hands. You are completely vulnerable now. He takes you upstairs to your very own bedroom. He has planned what he is about to do with military precision. He rapes you over and over and over and over. And when you think he has finally finished and will leave you exposed, he continues, You're going to kill me, aren't you? You cry, hoping that he will be remorseful and leave, but he stays, stinking breath, heavy breathing. I don't want to die. I don't deserve to die. I don't deserve to die. I have been good. You plead saying anything that will make him leave and bring comfort, knowing that you have survived. He moves slowly towards you. You feel his hand cover your mouth and nostrils and then terror. You can't breathe. You suck and suck and suck against his ghastly hand, but there is no release. No, please, no, you scream in your mind. The end has come. That scene, folks is one in which Marie-France Como was murdered by one of Canada's notorious serial killers. But he is a killer like no other. He has risen to the rank of colonel in the Canadian Armed Forces. As a Canadian Forces pilot, he has flown Prime Ministers on Canada One, that's like Air Force One for those listening in the States. He stood next to the Queen of England, saluting her. He is revered as an up-and-comer in the Canadian forces, geared to be in the upper echelons of power. He is in charge of one of the biggest Canadian forces bases in Canada, CFB Trenton. But he is a monster. His name is Russell Williams, and he is pure evil. Folks, settle in tonight. The wind's blowing across Lake Ontario. It is blustery out there. The snow's coming down. This is the perfect night for you folks of all nights to keep that fireplace nice and glowing. Settle in, relax, get a beverage of your choice going, get a coffee going, get a tea going, or even better still, a hot chocolate. But above all tonight, folks, no kids. Tonight... Serial Killers All Night with our guests from Montreal, live on, the, live on Skype, Lee Miller and his new book, Cold North Killers. And he's got another one out called, as I look for it here, Rampage. He was just telling me about it, Canadian Murder and Spree Killings. Here we go, folks. Lee, I want to welcome you to the show. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, Brent. Uh, can you see me? 
I cannot. Apparently, we cannot do the um, the video thing with this uh, particular setup of Skype, and I apologize for that. But not to worry, we will uh, we will continue on nonetheless. I hope you're in a safe spot tonight because um, the highway, the 401, which is the main highway, folks, it's the busiest highway in Canada, actually, that and North America, for that fact, that connects Toronto and Montreal. Is uh, there's tons of accidents on it tonight because of all the whiteouts. So um, there we go. Let's jump in right away, shall we, Lee? Let's get going right away. And remember, folks, I said no kids. We're going to start off right away with necrophilia. Let's talk about that. What is the attraction that people want to make love, have sex with dead people? What's going on there? Well, oh, there's uh, one of those things. There's a lot of different uh, pathways to it, and uh, it takes a lot of different forms. It's not always necessarily having intercourse with dead people either. It can be kissing or fondling them. Uh, it can be uh, masturbating over the corpses. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that's, uh, it's like uh, Kingston where, or Montreal where, where we are now. There's a lot of roads to get there, and it's, it's debated. It's, there's no one answer to that. But I can certainly uh, I can certainly discuss it with you. Sure, please. I, I you know I'm curious. I, I don't understand the the physical attraction. Is it a physical attraction? Is it a perversion? How would you classify this thing? Oh, it'd be a, it's a paraphilia. Um, and uh, there's a, for some people it's very much uh, about a deep seated insecurity. Uh, they don't want a partner that can reject them, uh, and the ultimate partner for that is a corpse. However, um, when you start getting into people that are doing sex acts uh, or even acts of kissing or fondling with uh, corpses that are in advanced stages of decay or even a skeletal, there's almost an erotic, eroticization of death going on there in itself. Uh, so it, we don't know how people uh, develop these paraphilias in general. Typically, there seems to be some kind of a genetic or, or neurobiological basis for it, which predisposes people to them. And uh, the reason, uh, well, a, a, a good point about paraphilia, which includes necrophilia, is they're kind of like cockroaches. Uh, you don't just find one of them in your apartment. If you find one, there's usually more. So if you have an, an offender who's a necrophile, chances are um, that he has a, a number of other paraphilia too. Now, Lee, I'm very curious here. By the way, folks, we're speaking with Lee Miller all the way from Montreal, Canada. He's uh, written a book called Cold North Killers. It's all about Canadian serial killers, the uh, Hall of Fame, as I call them, and that includes Russell Williams. That includes Paul Bernardo, Carla Homoka, um, who were known as the Barbie Killers. And I'm in a place called Kingston, Ontario right now, just down the street from me virtually just down the street from me, is the Kingston Maximum Security Penitentiary. And it goes back to the early 1800s. It's the, only, it's the oldest facility of its kind in Canada. Uh, what was alarming to me when I first moved to Kingston is all these serial killers were housed there. Uh, virtually the only thing between us and them were some armed guards and two feet, uh, two feet thick walls and some bars, and that was really unnerving for me. Um, easy way to get Lee's book is www.nightfrightshow.com. Just click on the book cover there associated with tonight's guest. That will take you right to a place where you can order the book from the comfort of your own home, and tonight's a good night to be uh, hunkering down, as they say. Um, let's go back to some of this. Necrophilia? Yeah, well, not necrophilia so much, but... I had so much more to say, Brent. Oh, please, continue, because I want to get to fetishes as well. Please, go ahead with necrophilia, because this is weird. <laughs> it's got to be outside the norm. I mean, this can't be something that's practiced by the masses. Well, no, that's uh, pretty much the, the definition of a, of a paraphilia, or, or even a fetish, really, is that uh, most people don't share in the attraction to it. Uh, like there is no uh, there's no paraphilia uh, for uh, sexual attraction to a, a a fully you know a 30 year old person if you're also 30 years old it's it's we're talking about abnormal 
things here. But, I mean, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily all bad. And you probably have some guests listen, listening that have paraphilia. And, you know, as long as you're not uh, hurting anyone, that's okay. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not to denigrate anyone. It's uh, Okay, but there you just said you're not hurting anybody. I'm thinking that anybody that's having sex with a dead person, uh, you may be um, harming their their dead being in terms of honor, but you certainly aren't harming them at all in terms of physicalness. And how does that lead to, I guess, extrapolating from that, how does that lead to an escalation where you're going to start killing people just to have sex with them? Oh, well, okay, let's, let's uh, dial it back a bit then, because I was talking about how these things kind of, it, there's pathways to it. Necrophilia is usually more or less the end of a pathway. Um, if we're going with the idea of the necrophile that wants the partner that can't reject them or can't criticize their sexual performance, there's kind of these paraphilias that may precede necrophilia. And so we're looking at stuff like uh, one of them is called somnophilia, and that's a sexual attraction to somebody who is asleep or unconscious. Uh, there, this could be done uh, in the case of a sex offender or a serial killer uh, by knocking someone uh, unconscious uh, like Ted Bundy. Did uh, by drugging them unconscious, like uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, or or uh, and uh, and violating their uh, their person while they're uh, unconscious. It could be watching somebody while they sleep and uh, and, and uh, masturbating to that. And, uh, and then uh, also along that same spectrum, you have something called a uh, Pygmalionism, and this is a sexual attraction uh, to dolls or mannequins. And this is a, a paraphilia that Jeffrey Dahmer had, pre preceding the necrophilia. Um, and I, I think you can see a theme. Well, but I, you know, there's a lot of blow-up dolls out there <laughs> that people order. And um, this seems to be a very common thing. People that order these things, it, it's not automatically going to lead to serial killing, is it? Oh, no, and neither is necrophilia. I mean, that's something that we have okay. to establish right there. These are just, yeah. these are like, uh, these are paraphilias that can be uh, as, as associated with serial killing. But, I mean, just, uh, I think that with the, the Pygmalionism, this is maybe a, a more healthy way for, for people who have uh, a, attractions to inert bodies that, to handle this. And, and even with the necrophilia, uh, it, it's not nice to think that, you know, if uh, we're in a morgue, or a funeral home or that, you know, someone might do something to our, our bodies. And we wouldn't like to think of something like that happening to a family member. But still, uh, no one is being uh, hurt, hurt. I mean, this is an ethical issue. We could debate it. And uh, actually, I've got, I've got a, text, a textbook I'm working on on necrophilia, which is going to do just that, where people are going to debate the, the ethics of it when murder is not involved. But uh, there is, when we talk about serial killers, there is uh, quite a, a large percentage, and it's debated, so I, I'm not going to give you a figure, uh, but uh, quite a large percentage of, of serial killers do commit acts of necrophilia, and it, they're just expressed in different ways. Jeez, I had no idea that, Lee. Now, you know, part of this uh, paraphilia is fetishes. Uh, you know, right away I, I think of the priests that are caught all the time with shoes, um, in their closets, they have shoe fetishes and things of that nature. Certainly these people are not going to commit serial killing crimes. But mm. what are some... Oh, am I wrong there? <laughs> well, yeah, you, you are actually. There Yikes. is uh, there is a shoe guy uh, that I can think of. He's actually uh, kind of like second tier of being known because Ann Rule wrote a book about him. Mm. His name was uh, uh, Jerry Brudos, and he was in the 60s in Oregon. And uh, what I said about the paraphilia with the cockroaches, this guy was also, he was a transvestite, he was a necrophile, he was a foot fetishist, and, uh, and he was into shoes. And the, the kind of first step in the, the development of, uh, of what we can say, uh, what we know of these paraphilias is apparently when he was five years old, uh, or around that age, he was rooting around in a dumpster, and he found a, a pair of like stiletto shoes that a, a woman had thrown out. And his own mother was uh, a very uh, modest, uh, one might say, uh, kind of uh, prudishly dressed woman. She was not the kind of woman that would wear stilettos. So for him, this was an object of fascination. He brings this home uh, to the house, and he shows his mother, like, look at this wonderful thing I found. 
And his mother reacts uh, with just uh, repulsion, and th- she takes it and she throws it away. And uh, she, basically, in doing that, uh, one could argue makes it kind of like a forbidden pleasure, which then comes to uh, be tied into his sexuality for the rest of his life. And so we were going back to like the age of about five years old here. And this guy, when he commits his, his first murder in his series, uh, he's a married man. Um, he's already got uh, some sex offenses under his belt. Uh, his wife, I don't think, knows anything about it. And he's home alone one day, and a, a woman selling encyclopedias comes knocking on the door. Uh, I guess they had door-to-door encyclopedia salesmen back then. Sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, she comes to the door, and he says, yeah, I'd like to buy an encyclopedia. Leads her inside. Uh, he picks up an object. He smashes her on the head with it uh, so she goes unconscious. And then I don't believe he had... Uh, now, this is just off my memory. I do, I do not believe he had sex with her corpse, but what he did do is he sawed off her foot, and he oh would keep God. yeah, he would keep the foot in the freezer, and he would take it out, and he would try these different shoes on it. And so then the way this guy progresses is with his subsequent victims, uh, he starts getting, um, from there he goes into necrophilia um, with the next victim. There's, he doesn't rape her, but it, it's, it's a post-mortem uh, sex act. And uh, then at, by the end of his uh, series, he's got them hanging uh, up by hooks in his garage. His wife still doesn't know anything about it because he just tells her not to go in the garage. She doesn't. And um, so he'll have these women hanging up on a, a hook in his garage, and he's trying clothes on them. He's, he's actually trying different outfits on them and, and photographing them hanging there and uh, and so of course when the police finally zeroed in on him they found this huge cache of uh, photographs of the women's uh, corpses with uh, dressed in all kinds of uh, different clothing two quick questions for you lee is his wife in danger and i think back to williams because here's williams going around killing these women and his wife seems relatively safe was his wife in danger as well Okay, so here's the difference between the two. Uh, now I'm I'm, I'm, sp- I'm speculating here because I don't That's know fine. If, That's if, fine. You know, if the guy's gonna uh, what he would do to his wife or not. But a, a, a big part of this comes down to like, to what degree is this person a psychopath? We often say, are they a psychopath or are they not a psychopath? Mm-hmm. And uh, really, uh, uh, it, it's more of. Uh, a, a gradient, a scale of psychopathy than you are or you aren't a categorical thing. Now with Jerry Brudos, I, I haven't uh, checked into it, but I would strongly sus- suspect that he was a psychopath. Mm-hmm. Uh, w- uh, Russell Williams isn't. Uh, not being a psychopath uh, means that even if you're a really bad, and sure we can use the term evil if, if you're into that term, uh, even if you're a real evil person, um, psychopathy, it's a, a psychiatric uh, condition. It's a personality disorder. And so what it does uh, is it, it, it blunts your, uh, your empathy. Basically, you, you don't have a conscience. You, you don't care about anyone except yourself. And uh, Russell Williams, not, uh, or not being a research cutoff psychopath, so someone with, who is a serial killer but has a lower level of psychopathy, probably actually did uh, care about his wife uh, and, and probably uh, loved to, to the best that someone like that can love. Yeah, I think so. And so had Williams' wife caught him uh, doing this, I mean, there's all kinds of variables that go in, but I don't think that he would have killed her. Whereas with Brudos, it's a coin toss because he probably didn't actually love his wife. For him... Uh, she would have been just an object of sexual gratification and she would have normalized him and, and provided like a mask for his behaviors. Can we shoot out to BC for a second and talk about Robert Picton? Oh, yeah. Can you tell us the story about Robert Picton and how you would classify him? Oh, Robert Picton, yeah, much uh, much more psychopathic than, uh, than Williams, uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't know... Uh, yeah, I would say he's probably a psychopath. Now, the, here's the, the problem with Robert Picton, is we don't really know what he did because he won't admit to it. Uh, and, it and if he has, uh, the details haven't really been released to the, the public. We what know, is he suspected of doing, Lee? 
Well, they found uh, DNA from uh, 31 missing women, mostly uh, prostitutes, uh, largely of Aboriginal descent, who were taken from downtown Vancouver. They found the DNA of 31 of these uh, missing women on his property. And uh, I, I believe he was, uh, he was convicted of killing six, but really they think it could be as high as 49. Oh, my God. Yeah, 49. That would make him Canada's most prolific, and that's actually uh, really high by American standards, too. That, uh, that uh, ties uh, the record by the Green River Killer, who I think is America's most uh, prolific sex murderer. Leanne, am I mistaken? Did he not chop the bodies up and feed them to the pigs? Uh, yeah, he did. Um, that was, uh, he also took them to a, a meat rendering plant, which is actually my grandfather used to work at a meat rendering plant. Oh, my. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, he would. He was really good at uh, disposing of the bodies, and that's one of the ways that he was able to get away with it so long. Because a pig will just eat, you know, everything up and all parts of it, bones and everything. Uh, but uh, there were just little, you know, little mistakes that he made along the way. And eventually, okay, I remember. Yes, this is how they they found him. Uh, they were searching his farm for a long time because they had a lot of hints that this guy was into bad stuff, uh, ha- also including like having illegal guns on the property. But he, there was also um, someone had seen, I believe, an asthma inhaler uh, linked to one of the missing women, Serena Abbotsway. They had, found, they, they had seen that lying around uh, Picton's trailer. And so from all this evidence, finally the RCM, RCMP and... Uh, uh, maybe in tandem with Vancouver Metro, uh, were able to do a search of his property. And they, they searched for days and days and days and days. And it was like they're just about to give up when someone went into uh, uh, one of the outbuildings and they opened up a, a, a freezer and they found, I believe it was two skulls. And the skulls had been bisected, meaning they'd been sawed in half. And inside these skulls that had been sawed in half were... The, were uh, a pair of skeletal hands within each skull. So, if you're, at, is that a necrophilic thing, or is it just like I'm making this as small as possible for the meantime before I dispose it? Well, you don't really know until the guy, unless the guy tells you. Precisely, folks. If you're just joining us, lots of time left, and we will be taking phone calls with Lee. Go, go get yourself a pen and paper right now. I'm going to give you the number in a few seconds. Folks, our guest tonight is Lee Meller. We're talking about serial killers. This may not be for the faint of heart. We're being very graphic tonight. Definitely no kids. Kids don't need to hear this type of stuff. And uh, easy way to get his books. One is called Cold North Killers. The other one is Rampage, Canadian Mass Murder and Spree Killings. Triple W dot night fright show dot com just click on the book cover associated with tonight's guest that'll take you right to a spot where you can order the book from the comfort of your own home um, and if you're ready folks if you've got that pen and paper three one zero four two one four zero five three three one zero four two one four zero five three we'll be taking your calls in just a few minutes. I want to go back to Lee now. Now, I had mentioned Lee, no kids right away. Is that where all this starts in childhood, or are you born predisposed to this? Is there a chemical imbalance or something biological more than behavioral? I would say uh, the juries, this is the, the endless debate that we're having. The, I'd say the best answer is probably it's a bit of both. I see. Yeah, because, and, and it gets hard to, it would be hard to know because nobody lives in a vacuum. Like, say you were born with genes that predispose you to uh, violence or psychopathy or another uh, severe personality disorder or a, a, a paraphilia. Um, even if you're born with those, you still undergo experiences in life uh, just by dint of being, uh, of living so then it comes down to, well, you know, the fact that he was bullied in school, did that really play into it? And if, if so, how much, you know? Mm-hmm. Did, the, did the fact that his mother uh, indulged him or, uh, too much or was uh, negligent of him too much, did, did that play into it? And because we know that there's people that are bullied in school that don't do this kind of thing. And, and so really it's, we're looking at um, 
probabilities. That's the best we can do, and we still don't have it down. But uh, it, it definitely, there's if there's a genetic uh, component or there's a neuro, uh, neurobiological problem, like such as a head injury that can happen after birth. And uh, a whole bunch of things that can happen to someone in life, uh, such as developing deviant sexual interests, uh, all kinds of different trauma. And uh, it's really, there is no one recipe. It's, it's, these guys are all, in a way, the only thing that they all have in common is that, uh, according to the new definition, uh, as of 2005, they killed two or more people on separate occasions. With, uh, and that's it. And that's it. <laughs> it. It honestly is. Yeah, this is what this is what I'm learning. Uh, I, I'm doing my PhD in this, studying these guys, and really that's it. Like, and, and sure, there is like, a lot more commonalities between them. Like, you know, there's a lot of necrophilia, there's a lot of uh, torture and, and rape, but they don't all do it. They don't all have the same motives. There's no one all thing except what I just described to you. So you really can't search. Well, I guess there are patterns you can search for but they may not be indicative of the person you're actually researching. Would that be correct? Uh, so uh, are, you, are you saying like um, somebody could uh, be a psychopath and uh, a, a pedophile, but uh, not necessarily be a serial killer? Precisely. Exactly. Yeah, there are psychopathic wow. pedophiles, yeah. And uh, uh, there's, all, there's all kinds of uh, people that have... Uh, any number of these problems and that go through much worse trauma than some of these guys that don't turn out this way. And so really, I think the, the way I like to see it is what the genetics do and what the, the social experience and the familial uh, and, and social environment of the person do is they kind of narrow the choices. So we're getting back to probability here. Is, it always, is there always a sexual component? No. Really? See, I always thought there was associated with this type of uh, uh, very, very. Oh, well, well, yeah. With a paraphilia, there there will be, but not all serial killers have paraphilias. I mean, a lot of them. Uh, I would say more common than sexuality is almost like a desire to have power, to feel powerful. Uh, people that generally must feel inadequate in some way, or have for whatever n need to feel like they are bigger than they are or to prove that they are bigger than they are. So let's think of, um, uh, if you remember the DC snipers sure. back in, in 2002, the, the DC snipers uh, were uh, two, uh, was a, a Jamaican teenager and uh, an American uh, older, older man, like I think he was in his 30s or 40s, uh, both, uh, both black. And they would drive around uh, the United States, but they're known specifically for their spree around D.C., Maryland. And they would uh, just shoot people randomly uh, with a, a sniper rifle from the back of a van. And they claimed a lot of lives this way. Now, we know, uh, because there was two of them, uh, there, that there's been no uh, mention from the younger one, who would be the submissive partner in, in the relationship, of anything sexual associated with the killings. Okay, so it's not like he was saying after we shoot someone, uh, John Muhammad would masturbate or he'd reach an orgasm. So there's really no reason for us to think in this case that there's any sexual component, but there's certainly a power component. And, uh, and, and there's uh, elements of uh, Islamist uh, terrorism in here because, uh, uh, yeah, Muhammad was a, a, a homegrown uh, Islamist uh, Convert. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, of and uh, of the wrong kind, yeah, and and um, yeah, and, and so really, uh, he would, and he would, they would taunt the police, and they would send messages. And so I think if you know, there need not be a sexual component because part of it can be if you if you feel like such a small person, or that in your life you've been minimized in some way, and then you. Are, you are the guy in the newspaper who has got the entire eastern seaboard of the United States terrified of you, and you're putting in phone calls and you're leaving tarot cards that say, dear policeman, call me death on them. Like That must be, for somebody that violent, and, and I think Williams probably was a psychopath, that must feel incredibly... Uh, 
self satisfying. Ex- yeah, that's it. the reading. I'm, I was looking for the term and I found it. It's an it's like existentially reinforcing. Mm. It's like saying I'm the guy that's doing it. I'm almost like the most important guy in America right now. All the TV news is covering me, and even getting caught. Well, you've gone down in history. We're talking about him right now. So. That's a very long-winded an- answer to you. No, but it, it, it's succinct, and I think it makes a lot of sense. Now, I want to ask you, as uh, again, I'm going to try and extrapolate some parallels from this. Several weeks ago, there was a, a series of people walking around the streets in gangs and trying to knock people out. Actually, one of the persons was actually killed because they fell and hit their head. Is that the same type of thing, but at the beginning stages of it, as the same as these snipers? Okay, so we're, there's more than one offender in this situation. That's a gang of people. Mm-hmm. Um, well, uh, if they were to kill two or more people um, on separate occasions, nice. then that, that would classify them as serial killers. Uh, but, uh, I mean, why are they knocking them out? Do they, do they have any, uh, is, the, is there any motive suspected? Are they, are they robbing nope. people? Something to do. That's all Something to do. Okay, so now we're moving into these like sort of thrill killer guys, and we see this. We see it in adults, but it's it's very much uh, 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 present in in teenagers too. And it's all, and I doubt there's a sexual component to that either. It's almost just like um, they feed off each other, and there's probably a, a dominant, more violent one in the group, and uh, and it's all about. Uh, the excitement of doing it together and one-upping each other, and it, it, you can call it recre- recreational violence. I've heard that term before. That was coined by uh, the Phoenix serial shooters. That were two guys that that would just go around shooting people from their car, um, from their cars, much like the DC snipers. So uh, um, that's terrifying. Yeah, there's commonality, but it, you know, it's uh, sometimes it comes down to things like mobility and access to guns. Maybe if these guys were more, uh, you know, had a van. And uh, and had a- access to the kind of weapons that uh, Muhammad and Malvo had, and they had uh, a more uh, a more of a mission than just doing it for a thrill, because there was the Islamist uh, whole thing in there. You know, it, it, it's sometimes it's not so much the desire as it is the means to be able to express the violence in a certain way. Is that making sense? It is, actually. Folks, www.nightfrightshow.com. Our guest tonight is Lee Miller, all the way from Montreal. And we're talking about serial killers. Serious subject matter tonight, folks. No kids. Very graphic discussion tonight. Uh, his books are called Cold North Killers. And the other book is called Rampage, Canadian... Um, Mass Murder and Spree Killing. Thank you, my friend. Yes. I was looking... I, my uh, pages slipped out of my hands. That's uh, okay. Thanks. Uh, while, Go while ahead. We were, while we we're uh, here, just because I, I got onto the DC Snipers case <laughs> by, by accident, uh, it just occurred to me. But I want to plug something else I'm doing. It's uh, a magazine, an electronic magazine, so it comes in PDF format. And uh, we've just put out our first issue. It's called Serial Killer Quarterly. And what it is, is it's a, a magazine which discusses uh, serial killer cases from all over the world based upon themes. And this issue is 21st Century Psychos, and it actually includes a feature on the DC Snipers um, by Michael Newton, who is a, uh, he's a well-known true crime writer. He wrote the Encyclopedia of Serial Killers. And we also have, I wrote an article uh, for it too on uh, John Robinson and Catherine Ramsland wrote one on Israel Keys. It was a really fascinating case. And so if anyone wants to subscribe or pick up a single copy of the magazine, go to www.serialkillerquarterly.com and you can just get it and, uh, just uh, through, through your credit card and uh, you've got something to read on your phone and uh, no one need know what you're reading because it's on your phone <laughs> or okay. on, on your tablet. So, and I'll put all those links up, folks, to www.nightfrightshow.com. No problem there yeah. whatsoever. Lee Miller's our guest tonight, serial killers, no kids. I'm going to give you the phone number, folks, 310-421-4053 if you want to ask Lee some questions. 310 Four zero five three. Lee, what are some of the warning signs if you're a parent, you've got kids? 
hmm, uh, that they may become a serial killer. Well, uh, yeah, it's hard to tell. I know when they're four or five or toddlers, but uh, would there yeah. be any early warning signs? Well, what the FBI has always advocated, but there, this has been called into uh, scrutin- under scrutiny of the scientific community, and they've said that there's no real basis to it, but this is kind of the, the thing that everyone goes to, is something called the McDonald Triad. Uh, the, the McDonald triad is uh, bedwetting uh, in, in, past the age of where it would be normal. So uh, say maybe a 12-year-old that, uh, continues to wet the bed, um, uh, setting fires. And, oh. uh, and uh, I'd say the biggest telltale sign of this three is uh, cruelty to animals, like whether killing animals or torturing them or... Or, you know, there's even people who have sex with them, which is a zoophilia. Most people who have sex with dead animals. That's necrozoophilia. So that, I mean, obviously, if your kid's doing that, <laughs> that's, you, <laughs> that's, that's a bit of a red yeah, flag. Right, right there, if your kid's yeah. having sex with dead animals, yeah, take them, uh, <laughs> take them and get them some help. But uh, John Douglas, who is the uh, famous criminal profiler, he said that if you have a child that is showing two of the, the three things on the McDonald triad, you probably want to get them checked out. Mm, okay. Now, some more questions for you. Now, you're not just talking about with kids, um, somebody stepping on an ant or squishing a spider or something. There's oh, no, no. I mean, I, I, I've destroyed civilizations of ants. Yeah, no. <laughs> something you're not telling us, Lee? Just teasing. I had it's a light it's it only one, <laughs> It's only one, Brent. There was, no, uh, there was no bedwetting or fires, so I didn't get taken to the psychologist. Thank goodness for that. (laughs) Um, Okay, mostly we've talked about tonight so far are males. Are there females that are afflicted the same way? I had mentioned Carla Homolka before. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there is. And they are are a very different breed. They're actually better at it than men. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. They are. 10% of the serial killers are female. And... uh, uh, okay, so do you want to just launch right into that? We okay. Yeah, if so, you don't mind, I, I you know I was always, you know, Carla Homoka was released, right? Um, yeah, She's yeah. In the Car- Caribbean <sighs> right now. Uh, yeah, don't get me started. Boil uh, your blood. <laughs> <laughs> in Canada, folks, uh, we had two mass serial killers. They were called Carla Homoka, and there's a movie out there, by the way, on her, and also Bernardo, uh, Paul Bernardo. They went. They were called the Barbie Killers. Just Skype that. Ken and Barbie, because yeah. they, they do look like Ken and Barbie. Unbelievable. And um, she got off. They let her out. Unbelievable, because she, um, she had given some... Well, help me out here, Lee. Uh, I'm going to try and paraphrase the story real quickly. She had given some evidence to her lawyer that would have incriminated her. Her lawyer sat on it and made a, a plea deal for her to get out. Get out. Then all um, of a sudden, okay, hold no, on. No, okay. It's been before Go you. Get, okay, you're off. Um, Carla, essentially, Bernardo was a, a, a really prolific rapist uh, before he married Carla. Um, before he married Carla Hamoka. And uh, they took his DNA during uh, the series of rapes because his, he matched the composite. Now, for whatever reason, though they had a composite that looked exactly like him, though they had um, a criminal profile that was extremely accurate, good one on the FBI for that one, uh, for some reason he was not prioritized. So though they took his DNA, they didn't process it until he had married Carla. They'd got their own home and progressed to uh, serial killings uh, where they had killed uh, uh, two women, uh, uh, well, two teenage girls in their home. Uh, and uh, they also accidentally, I guess you could make uh, call it manslaughter, um, they accidentally killed Carla's sister, but let's just not get into that right now. Um, it's all in my book, Cool North Killers. Yep. So um, uh Eventually, uh, the, they processed him for, uh, they processed his DNA after he had graduated to being a, a serial killer. And it was around this time, uh, Bernardo, he would beat, he would beat Hamoka and he would humiliate her and, uh, and he'd, he was a, he was a sadist, a sexual sadist. And he treated his wife really not much differently than he treated his victims, except he kept, kept her alive and she was, she was, Willing and compli- complacent, and uh, sorry, compliant in a way. And uh, so one day he beat Carla so bad that she left him. And this happened to coincide with the uh, with the DNA. And so the police came to Carla, basically said, "Look, we know who your husband is." And they offered her a, a plea bargain 
they had some videotape at the time, but I believe it was only about a minute and 41 seconds, and it didn't seem to implicate uh, Carla that much in the, in the murders. And so they made a plea bargain with her, is that if you basically rat on your husband, you know, you'll get a reduced sentence. And uh, so she took it, and then after that, uh, Bernardo's, uh, he's taken into custody, and he tells his lawyer, um, a guy called Ken Murray, he says, look, there's more videotapes. The videotapes are hidden in the house. Uh, they're, under, uh, they're behind a light fixture in the, the uh, bathroom of the house. Can you go to the bathroom of the house and get those videotapes? And, and keep a hold of them because I don't want the, the cops to find them. The cops had searched the house and missed them. Um, so Ken Murray uh, does this. And I guess, uh, like, I, I don't know. I, don't, I, I can't look it on the man's head. I can't look, you know, his, his soul if you go for that. So I, 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 so I, I don't want to put thoughts in his head, but he sits, on, he sits on these tapes. Like, if it was me, I, you know, the legal ethics be damned, whatever, this is morally wrong. Uh, sorry, buddy, uh, I don't care if I'm, you know, removed from the bench, I'm turning these in as evidence. Uh, but it was kind of, he was in a catch-22 situation because he was ethically bound to uh, not uh, incriminate his, his client. At the same time, he was also legally bound to, uh, uh, that if you come across evidence of a crime, to turn these over to the police. So he sat on the tapes for a while, and eventually uh, he went to some kind of uh, lawyer's, uh, uh, like a, a commission, uh, it, like a board that you would go to to ask what is the right thing to do. And they said, you know, turn the tapes in, man. And so he, he did, and then he had to step down as Bernardo's lawyer. And when they saw this new footage, uh, I believe, I, I don't know if Carla had been convicted or not yet, so, and I apologize for that. That's cool. But, um, but uh, when they saw this new footage, it showed that Carla was much more into it, uh, into uh, uh, doing uh, le- lesbian sex acts on these non-consenting uh, teenage girls that, that they had uh, kidnapped. And she was smiling for the camera. And, and so, in a way, uh, she, she got this deal with the police uh, based on who they thought that she was. And then uh, it comes out later who she really was. And I don't know why that wasn't a deal breaker, but apparently it wasn't. Um, and so if we're going to talk about Carla, yes, yeah, she's out now. She's living in uh, Guadalupe with her lawyer's husband. Uh, she's a mother. Uh, doesn't seem to have done anything wrong that we've heard of. Uh, is the sentence just? I don't think so. Uh, I, but, uh, Do you think and was, she's rehabilitated? Well, she, I mean, there's there's no um, there's no evidence that she's done anything wrong, right? You know, it's uh, so. Yeah, <laughs> is she still a a, a really sick person? It, it, does she deserve to be out? No, no. It, in my opinion, she doesn't deserve to be out, and I think she's uh, got a major personality disorder, probably a probably higher level of psychopathy than the people who assessed her thought. I think that she was so good that she tricked them all. And uh, I think she has a paraphilia called hebristophilia, which is a sexual arousal from knowing that one's partner has committed an act of violence, which also includes sexual violence. So is she dangerous? Well, I would say Carla's dangerous probably only if she were to come into contact with another man like Bernardo. Um, And that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, and this is an, the interesting thing about the, the female offenders, that a lot of them who work in tandem with male partners, it's like the, the male that enables them. And, the, and it's, it's called folly, folly a deux, uh, the French term, meaning uh, kind of a folly of two people, where it's like they bring out the worst in each other. And this can happen in, in, in male-male uh, serial killing partnerships, and it can also happen in the rare female-female serial killing partnerships, too. Wow. Now... Do you think her kids would be in danger once they hit puberty? I think they'd be more probably in danger from finding out who who their mother was and, and from other people finding out who their mother was and the media making their lives a living hell. Um, would Carla kill her children? Well, there's no evidence that she's ever committed, committed murder, right? And so the fact that... But I will say this. 
I'll add this on, okay? When you have a female serial killer who acts on their own, so not, not Carla, uh, she acted with Bernardo, but when you have a female serial killer who acts on their own, they are, m- most of the time, they will kill people in their families or that they are acquainted with or who are entrusted in their, their care, so like nurses that kill hospital patients. So female serial killers, much more so than male serial killers, will kill their own children. Whoa. That's explosively. Folks, we're speaking with Lee Miller tonight. We're talking about serial killers, uh, if you're just joining us. All night long, we still have well over an hour to go. I'm going to give you that number again, 310-421-4053, if you'd like to call in and ask Lee some questions. I'm sure he'd be more than happy to answer them. He's on Skype uh, tonight on Revolution Radio, uh, nightfrightshow.com as well. Uh, you can contact us once again at 310-421-4053. No kids tonight, folks. Please, no kids. Uh, his books are called Cold North Killers, Rampage, Canadian Mass Murder, and Serial Killing. And he has a brand new e-mag out called Serial Killer Quarterly. And all those links are on the nightfrightshow.com website. Um, Next week, folks, is Yuri Geller. He was supposed to be on tonight. He had a death in Israel, so uh, we had to reschedule him. And uh, Lee was nice enough to step up to the plate and step in tonight. He's uh, all the way in Montreal right now. How's the weather in Montreal tonight, Lee? Uh, it's just been consistently terrible since December. So uh, being a student and a writer and uh, editor of a magazine, I don't Make, I try not to go outside every day, so I could not tell you, but I, I would hazard a guess that it is blistering. Oh, no, I did go outside today, yeah. I went to the, uh, to the university, and yeah, it, it, was, it was cold. Uh, you know, I, I got a beard, and I, I, I know you don't wear one, Brent, but you know when you, you, start to. To, you used to. You know when you start to feel yep. the tips of, like, your mustache mm-hmm. freezing? <laughs> That's the way it is here, too, in Kingston, folks. Yeah. I hope wherever you guys are out there, you're settling in. You've got the tea going, hot chocolate, coffee, beverage of your choice. Settle in, folks. We're going to be looking at uh, serial killers all night. Now, uh, Leo is going to ask you, is there a time of year that, see, that serial killers seem more prone to be active than other times of the year? Ah, okay. Well, you know what? I would say no, but the, that idea has been batted around. Interesting. It has been. I've read. I've read papers on it, but and newspaper articles by mental health professionals claiming that there's some kind of a seasonal thing. I've heard spring. I've heard winter. Uh, I don't spring, know. Spring. Any mm-hmm. ideas why spring would see? I wouldn't think. I would think, of course, uh, in terms of the fall and uh, perhaps the deep dark winter as well. Yeah, I, I mean, intuitively, I would think winter, especially if you're in somewhere like Alaska or Edmonton, where it's just just dark so much of the time. Mm-hmm. You know, that's going to affect your mood, I would think. Um, but uh, no, not really. Uh, I, I don't think we should go beyond that because okay. I, there's there's no real evidence for it that I that I know of. Do they happen more in the nighttime or the daytime? Uh. 50 50 now maybe a little bit more leaning towards night uh but they can happen i mean we we're talking about bernardo okay he took uh leslie mahaffey at nighttime and he took Kristen french in broad daylight in the middle That's of the right. suburbs so really it um there's i think a lot of that will come down to the individual offender and what we're talking about is the the way that their lifestyle uh kind of forces them into offending in a certain way like uh, maybe there's a guy, um, uh, okay, Russell Williams. Let's, let's, let's say sure. Rus- Russell Williams, okay? He's in the, in the day, he's in charge of an Air Force base. Uh, when he's not at the Air Force base, uh, he's in, uh, which was in Trenton, uh, Ontario, which is quite a long way away from where his wife lived. Uh, they just uh, they were married, seemingly had a good relationship, but they had separate homes because he worked on the space and she worked for a nonprofit organization in a suburb of Ottawa called Orleans. But they'd, he would go there and sometimes be with her. Now, 
so then he would have been limited too by like his his wife being around to a degree. And I think that a lot of his crimes and don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure that a lot of them are uh, were were at night uh, when he would tell his wife, "I'm going out for a jog," because he had to circumvent that whole idea of my wife. Is like a control mechanism of my of my behavior now. We've just had somebody join us, folks. Right. Um, yes, hi, David. this is George. Hi, George. How are you this evening? Not too bad. Yourselves? Good, thank you. Where are you calling from, George? I'm um, from Philadelphia. Hey, welcome. Nice of you to join us tonight. I hope it is a nice, snuggly night for you, and you've got a, a nice beverage in front of you. Do you have a question for Lee? I have a question uh, that's kind of intertwined with a bit of a, a, a personal experience story. Um, we, on the topic of psychopathy and uh, serial killing, uh, I had graduated high school in 1998, one year prior to the trench coat mafia fiasco in Columbine, which mm-hmm. had, uh, you know, kind of spearheaded this, uh, I don't want to call it a trend, but, you know, this epidemic, if we want to call it that, of mass murderings in schools. Sure. Now, uh, if I had been a high school student after that, I was that kid who would uh, illustrate, like I would draw uh, posters for the prom and the hop and have drawings of people being shot up and I would Xerox them and post them all over the school. Nowadays, if a kid did that, you know, I would be thrown in jail from the counselors and who knows what else. But I have to wonder, if I didn't have that outlet for whatever anger or the chip on my shoulder that I had as a teenager, what would have happened? I don't know, Lee. Any uh, speculation? Well, I'm wondering if the kid doesn't have a creative outlet for his anger or any passion, whatever it may be, it'll bottle up into adulthood. And I wonder, I all, I've been wondering for years if... Okay, let's give Lee a chance to answer that question from George in Philadelphia. What do you think, Lee? Well, uh, George, you're, you're not alone. Actually, I was drawing graphically violent stuff from the age of seven when I think about it. So, I mean, I, because I would look at posters of, uh, you know, Jason and Freddy and stuff in the oh, video sure. stores. Yeah. And I don't know, it just it captured my attention more than Disney did. So, you know, I'd have, uh, I, I remember a specific drawing of having a brain impaled on a branch of a tree and blood all over the place when I was seven. But it was just like a curiosity thing. There wasn't even any anger associated with it. It was just... Uh, what I was kind of seeing and my mind was processing and putting it out. So I think you bring up an excellent point, actually. And, and as I was thinking about it, I mean, maybe you, you can go too far trying to, to, to predict. And you could actually damage the child. And like perhaps now, if I was seen doing that in school, they might have taken me to a counselor or removed me to some kind of special institution. And within the context of that institution, that it could have made me worse. Yeah, you know? they could create what they're uh, claiming to uh, try. And they, the, the cure would be worse than the disease, or they'll create the disease. That's yeah. exactly similar to when they arrest a kid for uh, a misdemeanor marijuana possession, or a, uh, a what have you, or a shoplifting possession. And if he goes to prison, you know, genuine mm-hmm. prison, he'll become a true hardened criminal more likely than not. Yeah, no, I... In I, fact, I, uh, who was the uh, the journalist who had his head cut off in uh, Iraq back that, in uh, uh, Daniel Pearl? That's right. That's yes. Right. Oh, I hear the music, folks. We're going to have to take a break. Lee Miller's our guest tonight, www.nightfrightshow.com. Uh, serial Killers All Night will be back in just a few minutes. Stay with us. And welcome back, folks. Thanks for joining us on this blustery evening here in the north. I'm broadcasting from Kingston. My name's Brent Holland. I'm the host of Night Fright, www.nightfrightshow.com. There you will find a wealth, an absolute wealth of archives. And um, I'm new to Revolution Radio. This is only my second week. And I thank you all for accepting me and welcoming me. I feel like uh, family already into the family of Revolution Radio and with the listeners as well. Folks, if you're just joining us tonight, 
Settle in. We have a full hour left, and we'll be taking calls as well. Serial killers tonight. Yeah, it's a heavy subject matter. No kids. Lee Meller's joining us all the way from Montreal, Canada. He's got a couple of great books out. One's called Cold North Killers, and the other one's called Rampage, Canadian Mass Murder, and Serial Killing. Now, Spree Killing. Spree Killing. I'm sorry. And the... Serial Killer Quarterly is his EMAG, which you can get all the links for those at www.nightfrightshow.com. If you've got a pen and paper handy, I'm going to give you a phone number. You are more than welcome to call in and ask Lee any questions you have. The number is 310-421-4053. I'll do that again. 310 310-421- Four zero five three. Let's go back to Lee. Lee, out of all your studies, have you ever freaked yourself out and scared yourself? Because I'll tell you, whenever I do a serial killer show, I can't sleep after. And it, tonight, I think, is going to be the same thing because these guys are right out there. And, I, you know, I, of course, I include the women in that as well. And you never know. You know, all of a sudden, you're, you're going to be walking down the street in the middle of a blinding snowstorm or down a back alley. You're going to run into somebody and think, can this guy be a serial killer? Have you ever freaked yourself out? No, it certainly made me more uh, alert. Uh, How I so? How so? Okay, uh, yeah, let's, let's just give some, like, basic uh, safety tips. And, and you know, uh, as a, okay, as a guy, oftentimes we think, well, you know, I'm not going to be a victim um, as, as a grown man, but uh, how many times has a stranger given you an open bottle of beer and you drank from it? Mm, good point. You know, good uh, point. Yeah. And even just an acquaintance, like you might, you might sort of know them, and they say, "Hey, man, you want a beer?" And you're like, "Yeah, of course." And then the next thing you know, you're unconscious and then strapped to someone's torture rack. <laughs> you know, <it's>, uh, <laughs> yeah. So I always watch. Uh, I always watch who's uh, buying my drinks and what's going in them. Uh, uh, I would say for um, the lady friends that are listening right now, any tips for them? Hmm. Uh, y- yeah. You know what? I'm drawing a blank. I'm sorry. That's okay. No, I'm <laughs> I, just I, I just you got me thinking about my own uh, personal things. But uh, well, let's I, stay on that. Tell us. Uh, you know. Tell us. Yeah. You know. You're, you're at. A, you're on Crescent Street one night. Crescent Street's a great place to party, folks. If you're going to go to Montreal for the F1 or the Jazz Festival or any other event. Um, that's a great place to party. You you walk out of a bar on Crescent Street, um, and stumble out. Stumble out <laughs> because we're ta- we're talking about me, right? Absolutely. Okay. Um, and you're <laughs> heading towards St. Catherine Street, which is a, a mainstay, but you're alone on this street, and all of a sudden there's somebody walking towards you that doesn't seem quite right. Your spidey senses are tingling, so to speak. How do you handle that? Uh, normally, I'm I'm just always prepared uh whether i'm sober whether it's day night whatever uh always just try and be vigilant about uh i mean you can't live your life in fear but uh always uh have a game plan in mind if somebody suddenly confronts you and certainly don't and don't fall for cons and 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 bruises that's that that's something that i think can apply to men and women uh, equally, like uh, if we can get into Ted Bundy for a second. Yes, let's go there. Yeah. Okay. So Ted Bundy, he was a good-looking guy, uh, charming and articulate, and uh, he would uh, get a lot of his victims by uh, faking being in need of help, so playing on people's good nature. And he would go. He would go to campuses, and uh, he would put on a fake cast or have, uh, and sometimes fake uh, crutches to accompany, and he'd be. Uh, kind of wait in the parking lot until he would see uh, a female that fit someone that he would want to victimize. And then he would make kind of a a display of trying to carry uh, these books uh, and and he would keep dropping them and, you know, oh, no, and and, and it looked like he's struggling. And so, uh, of course, there's there's women that go, uh, there's something... Not right about this guy, but then there's the other people that they're just they're good natured, and you we want to help people with injuries, and so uh, these women would uh, come up to him and say, are you, you know, are you okay? And he'd be like, oh, can you just this damn cast? Can you just help me get these books to my car? There was actually a scene in Silence of the Lambs 
uh, based on that, wasn't there, where the fellow that's going to uh, kidnap one of the young ladies is asking for help to put his couch in the back of his van, and he's got a cast on. Uh, yeah, you got it. So that's exactly where they, they took that from, was from Bundy. And while we're on that subject, just because mm-hmm. we had our friend Colin from Philadelphia, the, the, the girls in the pit in Silence of the Lambs was based on a Philadelphian uh, serial killer, probably its most notorious, called Gary Heidnick, just a oh. little side. Yeah, do you know that one? <laughs> no, and I, I'm kind of glad I don't because, uh, you know, that might be tomorrow night I can't sleep either. <laughs> so right. thanks for that, Lee. Thanks uh, for ruining my sleep patterns. <laughs> <laughs> the Miller folks, uh, 310-421-4053 if you want to ask Lee some questions about serial killers. Now, uh, I'm going to go back to that, who scares you the most. Is there, was there any surprises for you? When you when you're doing your research, what was the biggest surprise? Uh, as as far as like, oh, oh my god, I can't believe that happened. It's kind of scary. That type surprise. of thing, you know, like yeah. something that you just weren't expecting that you kind of stopped and you had a Facebook somebody or email <sighs> them and go, oh man. I I think that uh, one day I was just browsing. Uh, you know, you know, there's a town in New Mexico, New Mexico called Truth or Consequences, right? I had no idea, and, but thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there is, and uh, one day it just came in my head, and I was like, "That is a badass sounding name for a place, especially in New Mexico. It makes you think of like a western, right?" Mm-hmm. So I was going, uh, "Where where did it get that name from?" And I went to Wikipedia and uh, to see where it got the name. And uh, apparently they got they got it uh, from the game show called Truth or Consequences. It was like a contest. Yeah, not nearly as cool as I thought it would be. But um, I saw a name on there, and it said uh, like people of note from Truth or Consequences. And there was this guy uh, David Parker Ray, serial killer. Never heard of him. And uh, do we have a call there, Brent. We do, but uh, just finish your your story, and I'll go right to the caller in a second. So I clicked on the Wikipedia page. And uh, it took me to David Parker Ray, and I just saw a torture chamber called the Toy Box with $100,000 worth of gynecological equipment and uh, electrodes, electric breast stretchers, oh. spike dildos uh, of, of massive monstrous sizes. And that was the first time I'd, I think, just seeing $100,000 worth of gynecological equipment like the idea that someone would not only go to that extent, but would invest so much time and money and precision into like per- making the perfect way to torture women, that just sent a shudder up my spine. Well, it's funny because, you know, we always think of serial killers being somewhat derelicts, if you will, and not having that kind of money. We've got a call. Could you state your first name and where you're from, please? Oh, it's George from Philadelphia again. I had hey, to call George. back in. That's fine. I heard you mention uh, Gary uh, Heidnick, the guy from Philly. Yeah. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. This is the one in the 1980s who had all the prostitutes and women chained up in his basement, correct? I don't know that they were all prostitutes. Uh, I, I know he had a thing. They were okay, all. Okay. Uh, well, the, um, my my point is that fellow, a little known fact, and anyone, can, everyone can verify this. He was MK Ultra. Is that he, right? Yes, he was given massive amounts of LSD. I don't know if he was in the uh, he was in the military to to some capacity. I don't know if it was the army or the navy or or what specifically, but I do know, and this is verifiable. Mm-hmm. Anyone could punch his name into the search engines, and you'll it's public knowledge. It's declassified. He was given he was part of the CIA LSD tests, and um, Lee, have you I don't know what else could have made him that way. Lee, have you come across anything like that in your studies? Uh, I know that uh, for people who have predispositions uh, to, to schizophrenia, that using psychotropic drugs can uh, exacerbate it and really bring that out. Uh, there's a guy called uh, Herb Mullen in the early 70s in California who had that happen, and he was taking uh, lots of LSD, and he became a serial killer of 13 people. So... Um, yeah, it's it, it's not basically you know if you take LSD you'll become a serial killer or but it can it can uh, it's not good uh, not a good drug for you to take if you have a family history 
of uh, of schizophrenia or any kind of signs uh, to stay away from it. Right. Well, you know, I grew up as an artist mostly, and uh, the everyone, I, the, the the crowd I did who experimented with LSD, no one would do it. You know, every day or even no. once a week. Mm-hmm. You know, it was always that was always considered a waste of uh, the trip, if you will. Do you think people Lee can be programmed to be a serial killer? Um, I'm going to give you an example here, where they can go out and commit murders um, uh, after hypnosis or something like that, and be completely unaware of it. I think the guy who shot John Lennon was exactly that. Lee, what do you think? Uh, Chapman, well, first, uh, first of all, he's more like a stalker, assassin than a serial killer. It's a, it's a one-time act, right? But can people be programmed uh, to do that? Um, I have, uh, I'm fortunate enough to work with uh, professors, uh, probably one of the best in the world on the top of, topic of hypnosis. And I asked him this question, and he told me that, no, he did not think that uh, hypnosis was that could do that. So I'm just oh. I'm giving you, his and I, I'm giving you his answer because he would know more than me. But I mean, it, yeah, I don't think that that MK Ultra thing with Gary Heidnick. I mean, yeah, that certainly could have pushed him over the edge, definitely. Wow. And you know, Montreal yeah, folks, hypnosis is the wrong word. And you know, Montreal folks is uh, a big hub for uh was a big hub for MK Ultra right there at McGill University and the, Oh yeah. Yeah, big time, big time. We'll do, be doing a show on that in the future as well. Yeah, there's a lot to classify it. Uh, I don't want to take over your show, so I'm going to get off the horn now and I try to the call. keep if, my uh comments relegated to the chat room. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, thanks and uh, if either of you get a chance, I'll, you know what, I'll try to find a link on my myself for you and post it in the chat room. But the trouble is I can't remember how to spell this fellow's name. Hide Nick, it's H E I D N I K and his first name is Gary. I D N I K. Okay, cool. All right, thanks a lot, gentlemen. Pleasure to meet you, George. Likewise, likewise. Have a great evening. You too. We have another caller joining us via Skype. Thank you, George, for that. Uh, his name is Alan, and he's in Washington. And uh, just give me a second, Alan. I'm going to get you right in here. We have to do our own tech, folks. Let's see if Alan's there. Alan, are you there, my friend? Hey there. Hey, how you doing? You have to turn off your radio because there's a 30-second delay. Okay, I turned it off. There we go. How are you, Alan? I survived a great conversation with Dr. Josiah Thompson, and I'm thrilled. Great. Tell the folks who this Josiah Thompson is. Uh, Josiah Thompson is a, a revered scholar from uh, who's devoted his attention and his integrity and his um, life, his abilities. Well, not not exclusively. He's a remarkable person. He was a professor of philosophy at Yale and Haverford College. He was educated at Oxford and uh, University of Copenhagen, expert on Søren Kierkegaard, and someone who is an extraordinary uh, um, figure in the subject of uh, studying President Kennedy's assassination. He published a landmark work in 1967 called um, Six Seconds in Dallas, uh, and he is, has now a, um, a new book which as yet is unpublished called Last Second in Dallas, which basically depicts an extraordinary and fascinating journey, his personal journey as point A in 1967 and point B where he is now reevaluating some of the conclusions and some of his observations from 45 years earlier. Very so cool. cool. Yeah. Let's let's go to uh, Lee. Do you have a question for Lee? I do indeed, Lee. I'm very interested in uh, your presentation, the subject, and the uh, the manner by which you're approaching this subject. Uh, I'm curious. I didn't hear the first portion of the interview. Are you familiar? Have you done any work looking at the example of a man named Ed Gein? G E I N. Well, let's yeah. tell the folks who that is, because I'm unfamiliar with that name. You maybe, are. Wow. Maybe that's not a bad thing. I'm thinking. Yeah, I, I'm amazed that you're unfamiliar with Ed Gein. Ed Gein is sort of like one of the the ten most known serial killers, probably in American history. 
he uh, he was the basis for uh, Norman Bates in uh, Robert Bloch, uh, Bloch's Psycho. Of course, yeah, yeah. yeah are you yeah. ringing a bell now? Now okay. it is. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay, so Ed Gein, yeah, uh, a necrophile. Although we, he never, I don't think he ever admitted to having uh, doing anything sexual with the bodies, but he had so much. Uh, parts of dead bodies and corpses around this place that one can reasonably predict that there was something going on there with that. Uh, he was a cannibal, I, uh, I believe, too, which is something we often see associated with necrophilia. Why is and that? please go ahead, go ahead, Alan. I'll ask my I question. I was just going to add. Uh, I'm sure Lee could speak with greater authority than I, but he's also the inspiration for the figured Buffalo Bill in the Academy Award-winning film, The Silence of the Lambs, because apparently he was uh, not averse to indulging his urge to create a suit, basically, in which he would clothe himself uh, made from the skin of a deceased victim. Yeah, or, or or several, I believe. I think he would sort of sew the the skin right. together. That's but those exactly. those weren't necessarily uh, taken from uh, the women he killed. I, I, actually, Gein was a uh, a grave robber and uh, much more uh, prolifically than he was a serial killer. And I think I actually heard a theory once that the the reason he graduated to the serial killing. Uh, was because the the ground was frozen at certain times a year, and he couldn't. Yes, play his right, because he's in Wisconsin with cold, Exa long winters. Yeah, Ex exactly. Uh, but I don't know if that's if that's true or the reason. But uh, you know, that's I've heard that. And so, yeah, he would uh, he would don a a costume made uh, to uh, from various female body parts, uh, to make him look like a woman. And uh, he would go frolicking in the Wisconsin moonlight in this costume. And whether that was some kind of weird way of trying to become transsexual or whether he got a, sec a sexual kick out of it or maybe he was just uh, severely schizophrenic, I don't think they've ever determined that because Ed didn't really talk a, a lot about his motivations. In fact, I think Dr. Helen Morrison asked him about uh, basically, you know, what gives Ed. And he was like, oh, that was all just some experiments. Really? You know, this is creeping me out, this stuff. I've got the lights on, folks. I hope you're doing the same thing. <laughs> like this, I don't even know. You know, uh, Lee, i got to tell you, these serial killers, Ah, oh, uh, in your estimate, Lee, how many serial killers are out there right now free walking the streets? In which country? Okay, let's say the United States, and then we'll do Canada. Okay, well, now that the standard's been lowered to... Uh, killing uh, two or two or more people on separate occasions. It used to be three, and it used to be much stricter standards. So, if you take a country like the United States, you've got three hundred million people, right? Mm -hmm. The people that have killed two or two or more people on separate occasions, I would have to say over a thousand, wouldn't you? Oh my God! I thought you were going to say maybe two or three, four people. No, That's... that have killed two or more people. I mean, because this this. Uh, category now is so broad that you, we could even throw uh, gang members in there, right? right. So do, yes, you, that's right. do you yeah. think it's been lowered too much? Uh, yeah, I think that... No, I don't think the... Vic, uh, confusing question, Brent. We'd be talking about it all day. It's, it's something hotly debated among the, the, commu uh, the, the community of people. Yeah. Because I always thought serial killers, there was a deviance involved. I didn't well, think it was just the one, you know. Uh, well, there's I, more than one sort of uh, explanation. There's more than one cause. There's more than one methodology. It, there's more complicated than an absolute declaration that all serial killers are this because of that. Yeah, Alan, actually, I know you missed the first half of the show, uh, and, and you're right on the money. But what I said to Brent at the start of the show is the only really real thing these people have in common is that they've killed two or more people on separate occasions and that's because a serial killer really is a bit of a socially constructed category because the fact we can even change the victim count required to be a serial killer demonstrates that interesting it, yeah it is interesting you know I'm, I'm thinking of a show like uh, the sopranos you know tony had killed more than one person on uh, right. throughout the show and now all of a sudden he would be considered a serial killer and yet in my mind, he wouldn't be a Hannibal Lecter in any sense. 
Right, because there's there's no uh, sexual component. It's just it's it's business. It's criminal enterprise, right? So or yeah. like re- revenge, but it, it it all comes down to individual definition now, and that's sort of a, uh, it's the problem. But at the same time, uh, why shouldn't we consider him a serial killer? Like he's he is killing people. He's just doing it for different reasons. So there's there'll be people that argue back and forth about you know well, would Tony Soprano be a serial killer, and I'd say, well, yeah, his motivations is different, you know? Mm-hmm. Understood. Uh, Alan, do you have another uh, a question for uh, you? Just thanks for the informative approach and the fascinating information on a probably underreported sociological phenomenon, and uh, for the work that you're doing. Hey, yeah, great to meet you, Alan. It was a, it was a fun conversation. Thank you. Take care. Thank you very much. Good night. Thanks, Good night. Alan. Take care, buddy. Bye. Bye. That was Alan from Washington. Folks, if you'd like to call in with a question, 310-421-4053. I'll do that again, 310-421-4053. Now, we never answered the question, Lee, how many serial killers in Canada? And don't say they're all living in Kingston. <laughs> but you said roaming free. Yeah. Well, that, didn't they close? They closed Kingston Pen now, didn't they? Yes, they did. Actually, they moved those. Uh, I call them the Canadian Hall of Fame. Um, geez, I guess it's going back to October. To my neck of the woods. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> we all know Quebec's a distinct society, so that's fine. You can uh, you can have those guys. <laughs> Any idea how many might be wandering the streets in Canada? I would say, uh, you know, take the, okay, so I've, uh, I, I estimated a thousand, which was really just uh, a guess uh, in, the, in the States. So that was based on what, 300 million. We've got 30 million. So just reduce it by a tenth and you've got, what, 100? Yeah. Wow. Sure. Yeah, the numbers are astronomical. And, uh, yeah, but I mean, I don't have evidence for that. That's, a, that's yeah. an intuitive thing, you know. Uh, so I don't want anyone going online and going, what an idiot, you know, like I was asked a question and <laughs> I gave you my, uh, off the top of my head, what I would estimate. www.nightfrightshow.com, folks. There you will find all the links that we are speaking about tonight. Uh, there you will find the links to get Lee Miller's books, which are Cold North Killers. Rampage, Canadian Mass Murder, and Spree Killing. And, of course, you will be able to sign up. There's going to be a link there for Serial, serial, I'll get it, serial Killer Quarterly, and that's an EMAG. Uh, that, tell us a little bit about the EMAG. What brought that about? That's a great oh, endeavor. Yeah. Yeah, I just uh, I realized that it, it, now that you can, self, you can probably make more money uh, publishing stuff online, than uh, you can through conventional publishers because more and more people are reading online and you don't have the overhead of, uh, of printing things, you know, like uh, the costs. And, and so not, not only that, it would, it would give me greater creative control because I wouldn't have to go through, you know, a, a publisher. I could edit it myself. And so I started looking into, uh, you know, my favorite true crime writers and just uh, who I'd met uh, through, ver- through the community, uh, <laughs> And uh, I, I can't believe it. Like, I, I just got really lucky. I, uh, people were very uh, uh, warm to the idea. And the next thing I know, I've got um, Harold Schechter writing for me, uh, uh, Dr. Catherine Ramsland, mm-hmm. uh, M- Michael Newton, uh, Kathy Scott, who did uh, the, uh, books on the murders of Tupac Shakur and, uh, and uh, Biggie Smalls. Uh, I have uh, Carol Ann Davis, who's uh, well known in the United Kingdom for this. Burl Bearer, who has a radio show out on the, the West Coast, and he's written about serial killers. And uh, and so then the staff writers are uh, they're good authors from Canada, but then they do shorter pieces, and we bring in two or three larger features uh, from these uh, more well known uh, authors, uh, largely international, and uh, the the articles. Are, are really amazing. The issues are thematic. The first one's called 21st Century Psychos. It's all about uh, serial killers in the 21st century. So it's got the Russell Williams case in there. Mm-hmm. It, it's uh, got the, uh, the DC Snipers case in there. Uh, it has a guy in Russia uh, called the Chessboard Killer, Alexander Pachushkin. It has a piece on uh, the slave master, the, uh, John Edward Robinson that I wrote, and he was the Internet's first serial killer. And uh, so this is a, it's a really cool publication, and I'm really proud of it. 
and we're really excited with, about the authors that are writing it. And uh, one thing I want to just end with is, sure. is it is an entertaining read. It is, uh, it's like reading true crime, but at the same time, it's, it's not sensationalist. We don't take this, we don't take this lightly. You know, uh, I, just, I maybe put a little bit of humor in the sidebars or the movie reviews, but this is, it's, it's taken very seriously. And because I'm able to bring, um, such great writers together, but also my knowledge and their knowledge of this topic, it's also educational. Uh, a lot of the little sidebars of the articles will teach you about things like, uh, a necrophilia or sexual sadism, or, or they might just be little uh, anecdotes. Uh, so this is a cool magazine. Uh, go to www.serialkillerquarterly.com. I really encourage you to su- subscribe to it. It's less than $20, and you'll get four issues uh, by some of the best uh, true crime writers in the world. The Miller folks, Lee, what's the attraction? Why are we attracted to serial killers? What's going on with us to want to do a show, a two-hour show tonight? For you to want to write books on it, uh, an emag. What's the attraction for the world? I mean, there's so many serial killer movies as well. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, I think that we can contrast it with the kind of the lack of the comparative lack of interest in mass murder. Like when a mass murder happens, it's big news because it's it, there's you know often a large victim count and people feel, oh, God, why are all these people blowing up? But nobody goes out and and does. This movies or TV shows or, or, and there's a lot less books about mass murderers, right? Mm-hmm. Then there's about serial killers. So what's the difference? And I'm thinking, I'm going to go with two things here. Sure. Um, one, I think it's, it really comes down to the, uh, the sense of mystery is when a mass murderer uh, occurs, we know pretty much right away who's done it and then it's over. But with a serial killer, it's, it's almost like a, it's a continuing story. Who is this guy, and why can't we why can't we catch him? You know, is he a, a weirdo? Does is he a wife? Does he sorry? Does he have a wife? Does he does he live on his own? What's driving him? Where is he going to strike next? Is he going to strike next? There's so many questions that just arise from this person existing in the first place. That that you know why you have the why that's associated to mass murder. And that's pretty much really the dominant question. But why is just a part of the serial killer thing? And I also think uh, it's the idea, too, of uh, I think we're a lot more interested in deviant uh, sexual things uh, and, uh, and people who are, who are misanthropic and uh, to the point of being homicidal towards strangers. I think we're a lot more interested in those kind of things than we would like to admit. And... Why? Ooh. Why, Brent? You're a human being too. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. Um, I had this discussion the other night about horror, and my, uh, you know, why the attraction to horror movies? And they're they're consistently putting out horror movies. They're consistently putting out this type of movie as well. I think it's because it makes us feel secure in a safe environment, and perhaps. Um, to know that we're not that uh, off the deep end, if you will. Oh, no, good point. Actually, it's that kind is... of a validation that uh, there really is a difference between uh, our own belief systems and that type of thing and, and where these people have gone. That's definitely it. And, you know, in, in, in your darkest hours, you can go, uh, you know, my life is going to pieces. I, I just, uh, why am I so weird or screwed up or whatever? And then, you can, and then you can turn to these people and you go, you know, I am so far from that. Mm. Thank God. And, and so I got, into this, uh, I got into this topic when I was going through a hard time in my life. And, and it helped me deal with it. I don't want to get into the details. but That's just, fine. That's fine. Yeah, but, yeah. you know. If you want to talk about that, that's no problem. Folks, 310-421-4053 is the number, as always, if you want to join us online and ask Lee some questions about serial killers we're discussing. Now, I should just tell you, folks, uh, next week is Yuri Geller and the show every Tuesday night between 8 and 10 p.m. Uh, the show is called Night Fright, www.nightfrightshow. There you will find all the archives of all the shows. The following week on the 11th is Bill Burns. I was just on his show last night, Ashley, and Bill Burns, of course, for those of you uh, that are fans of this show, will know he's been on the show before, and he is the 
ex-host, because the show is no longer on the History Channel, of UFO Hunters, and we will be discussing UFOs. The following week, two guests. Mark Leslie will be here talking about his new book on horror stories from a city that I used to live in called Sudbury. And the second hour will be Vince Palarama, who has done intensive investigations on the uh, Secret Service and the JFK assassination. The following week, very, very special guest, Reza Khalili. Now, he was a CIA covert op undercover in Iran with the, um, with the guards there. And he brings to the show something very, very alarming. He will be in disguise throughout the whole show. We're going to disguise his voice. Last time I had him on TV, uh, he wore a mask virtually. There are Iranian hit teams out there to get him as we speak because he revealed some top secrets that he will t- be talking about when he joins us on the 25th to the CIA about what was happening in Iran. So that is going to be very explosive. Let's go back to Lee. Lee, let's talk about sexual sadism and mutilation. Um, is this whole thing just about violence for these guys, control and violence? Uh, the, I think the it depends on the offender, because if you get someone like uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, um, apparently had to get blinding drunk uh, to kill his victims, uh, he would, uh, I think for him the violence was just a means to an end, and that end was to have uh, the, the bodies, uh, the body parts and the possession, you know, he was, uh, of them, of a person. He didn't want people to leave him. And so the violence for someone like Jeffrey Dahmer uh, is just a vehicle to a greater goal. Uh, and whereas uh, it's with sexual sadism, mm. you're looking at someone like, like more like David Parker Ray, who I probably, you know, that's a great example, the guy I was talking about with the gynecological equipment. And so the violence for him is eroticized so, uh, as a sexual sadist. So... To, to the extent where the only way he can get off sexually uh-huh. is by inflicting, uh, sorry, by watching the physical or psychological suffering of a victim. And the reason I caught myself on inflicting is because that's, that's a misconception about, about sexual sadism. It is not about the doing of it. It is about almost like porn. It's like watching the person react. Really? So, you know, I go back to Williams again, Colonel Williams, and we know that he tortured his victims as well. Is this what it was for him? It was just a means to an end and uh, just to raise that exhilaration throughout his, his body? And, and is, it a, is it an attempt for them to feel? Yes. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, okay, before I go with it, um, let's keep in mind that uh, Williams videotaped the de- uh, not just the rape, but the, right. the, the death of Marie France Como. Right, so maybe like why would he do that? Because Paul Bernardo didn't do that. Paul Bernardo uh, taped hours and hours of rape, but cut, you know, cut it off at the death part. So that raises some questions about Williams, doesn't it? Uh, it sure because, does. like, let's be honest, he's watch he's watching these videos and he's masturbating to them, and that means the death is is there too. So maybe in the case of Williams, there was a sense of uh, of the violence, the actual murder being the absolute destruction of the object of his desire and and because he desires it it torments him and when he by destroying that object uh he elevates himself in his person and he can relive that by watching the videotape and yet you know and folks i'll tell you colonel williams uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with that name uh, south of the border um, he's probably our most reputed, next to the, the Barbie and Ken killers, uh, serial killer. He went all the way to be colonel in the armed forces here in Canada, so much so that uh, he would pilot uh, the prime minister around. He is uh, seen in many pictures with the queen, um, all kinds. Of, I mean, you know, talk about right up to the higher echelons. He commanded virtually uh, Canada's. I think it's its second biggest uh, Canadian forces base. And um, this guy was a serial killer. And one of the women he killed 
actually worked for him on the base, and he wrote a sympathy letter to her parents. Mm. Like, he was able to take himself out of himself, and uh, it's almost like he adopted this persona that was completely outside of himself in order to kill these people. Would there be something to that effect as well? This guy just puzzles me, that's why, because I have the greatest oh, yeah. respect for the people in the forces, and, and fans of this show know I do, and to think that uh, an evil person like this could get to the higher echelons, I mean, he was almost made a general. Yes, and that's because of the low level of, of psychopathy. Like, this is a person that's financially responsible and goes to their job, and he doesn't uh, act in, act, you know, hasn't acted impulsively or lived a parasitic lifestyle and doesn't have a criminal, a criminal record. So those are all indicators of the low levels of uh, psycho uh, psychopathy in this individual as compared to someone like uh, Paul Bernardo um, or, or Ted Bundy. Uh, uh, and so I, I actually want to raise kind of a, a really sure. surreal uh, fact with that murder that we've talked about so much uh, of Marie France Como. Uh, you started the show with it describing how she was... Uh, uh, he got her in the basement, and uh, we just talked about how he had videotaped the rape and, and uh, suffocation, the death of her. That happened in a tiny little town uh, in Br called Brighton, Ontario, which That's is right. not—it's not that far from you, Brent. It's in, Gee, thanks for that. <laughs> right, but that. <laughs> but here's absolutely right. Here's the surreal part, and this is why this case got to me. And if you read Cold North Killers, I, I, I very much address this. Mm -hmm. I was living in Brighton, Ontario, and I was writing the first book, exhaustive book, on Canadian serial killers on the night that he did that. Oh, my God. Isn't that a, just a, a weird coincidence? Like, if it had been a huge city, like... Toronto or Montreal, yeah. something like that, I would have gone, well, there's you know, millions of people sure. here, so the chances that a serial killer will be happening while I'm writing the book. But in Brighton, it's tiny. Everyone there's old. They're all retiring or, or mili you know, military people that are living off base. Yeah. So, uh, What's the population of Brighton? A couple of hundred? Maybe a I don't, thousand. I don't even. I don't even know. Like it's there's nothing there. I, I don't even. When I was I was living kind of in the country on the outskirts. Yeah, it's cottage really, country primarily, isn't it? Basically, they don't even have a bar there. Like they, they, yeah. there's yeah, there's no reason to go into town. So, oh, actually, no. There's a good pizza shop. Sorry, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. So it's a very very small town, and emphasis on the on the word town. Yeah, and uh, so for me, that was, uh, and then the other girl, uh, Jessica Lloyd, uh, I guess it was mm -hmm. two, two, three months later, she disappeared from Belleville, and I have, I have family uh, who, who, and friends who work in, in Belleville, which is also near Brighton, and I remember at the time seeing that, uh, that uh, these, the, this murder of Como had taken place and that Jessica Lloyd had gone missing, and I'm thinking to myself, the first thing that goes is like, it's a serial killer, and then I go, Oh, Lee, shut up. You know, you're just like, it's because you're writing this stupid book. People go missing all the time. They're not all victims of serial killers. There's all kinds of explanations. It could be a one-off murder. It could be any number of things. And you know what? It not, only, it not only turned out to be a serial killer, it turned out to be like one of the definitive serial murder cases in Canadian history. So I was like, I was getting this thing, you know, and I, I, I don't believe in this kind of... Um, metaphysical cause and effect, but it does cross your mind, like, did I, by writing about this, make something bad happen, you know, like, in that place? And I didn't. And no, of course I, not, of course not. But, it, you know, that did cross my mind. That was one of the things that occurred to me. It'll play on your mind. I should tell you this as well. As I had mentioned before, that Colonel Williams was housed here in Canada's maximum security penitentiary called Kingston Penitentiary. It is closed now. But he would insist that the guards call him Colonel. Can you imagine that? Now, they didn't, but he insisted that they call him Colonel. This is the type of ego and narcissist they were dealing with. I would have called him Colonel Pedophile because he was a pedophile. They found child porn on his computer. Oh, yeah. did they? Yeah, they did. He, uh, he didn't defend against any children that we know, but he was also... A, and yeah, he didn't... Oh, by the way, I'm telling you this, mm -hmm. because he was really, really concerned about the world knowing this. And so I'm letting you all know that this uh, POS uh, was, a, it, it, it was a pedophile, too. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm telling you that because I know that it's going to sting him the more people that know that. 
I, I guess uh, he, he thought that was probably worse than being a serial killer, and uh, who, who wants to get into that debate? But uh, Is there serial killers that prey on just uh, solely children? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. God. Can you, mm-hmm. can you tell us any of those stories? Yeah, if you want to hear them. Um, yeah, we'll country. put it out there. I mean, we've gone this far. We might as well go the whole route, right? Pick a country. Canada. Canada. Okay. Um, do you know there's an unsolved case here in Montreal? I'm, I'm writing about oh. it for, for the third issue of Serial Killer Quarterly. It's an unsolved uh, series of child murders. Oh, please and, tell, tell. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. So th- this is uh, from... 84 to 85, although I recently saw an article where the, the police here are now thinking that he may have also preyed on female victims going into the 90s. Now, I don't have access to the information that they're using to link these crimes, so I can't comment on whether I agree or not. But I have looked at the ones from 84 to 85, and basically what happened is uh, uh, one day in uh, 1984, uh, two boys uh, were coming home from uh, like a church group and disappeared. Earlier in the day, uh, a, a boy who was younger than them, because they were about, I think they were about 9 and 11 respectively, mm-hmm. uh, a boy who was younger than them, he was 4 years old, uh, he was uh, abducted, uh, he, he, was, he was out with his friend, and a man came and offered him candy, oh. and uh, the, the one friend didn't get in the car, and the other, but uh, this child, Maurice Viennes, who, uh, who went missing, did. And that, uh, that was the first incident. And then later in the day, these other two kids go missing. And so this all happened on the same day. And um, they found Maurice Viennes first, and they found him in an abandoned house, uh, kind of, I think it was at the edge of the, like in the countryside near the edge of the suburbs. Uh, I can't. I, I don't know if he was beaten or strangled to death. There was indications he'd been sexually abused. Oh, and, there, and you know what they found just pouring out of his pockets? Candy. Oh. Yeah. And then uh, the later, uh, they find the body of uh, Wil- Wilton uh, Lubin, who was uh, the only uh, a- African-Canadian victim. He was taken from the, the two boys that left the church group. The other was... Um, was uh, a Quebecois boy called Sebastian Metivier. Well, they found Wilton Lubin uh, floating uh, in the St. Lawrence River. There'd been an, an attempt to slash his throat, but I think that he had been killed by some kind of uh, manual compression on the throat. I'm not sure. Well, when I say manual, I'm not sure if it... Uh, there was compression. I'm not sure if it was a ligature or manual strangulation. They've never found Sebastian Metivier. And I know the family is, uh, they, they're still, in their hearts, they're looking, and it must be, and probably t- doing what they can, but, you know, after this passage of time, I, I can't even imagine where you would begin. And then, in uh, 85, uh, there was a boy uh, around the same age as uh, M- M- uh, Morris Fien, the, uh, the first victim, and uh, he went missing, just playing outside his house. And uh, they found him uh, kind of, they found his body uh, in more or less the same direction, heading east out of the city. And I believe that there was some I- indication uh, that, that the behavior that had, uh, the criminal, what you'd call the signature, mm-hmm. um, uh, and uh, the MO, uh, they, they correlated between uh, Morris Vian and, uh, and the second boy, Dennis Rue uh, Bergevin, I believe his name is. So that's, uh, that's an unsolved. Uh, case we have here in Canada too. Um, That's I, terrifying to think that young kids of that age. Now they were all boys. I was, you know, I was in university when Jean Le, um, what's her name? Oh, Jean Lien. She was a young girl. She was only ten years old, and she disappeared. What area of the city was that in? Uh, I, I believe, the, yeah, that the the, um, the first three boys were taken from uh, the East End. I think it was like uh, Hochelaga Maisonneuve. Mm-hmm. So that's. A very francophone area, mm-hmm. and uh, the other boy was, uh, I think he was taken more from like it, a little west of Point St. Charles. Uh, That's so, where Jolien, uh, Jolien uh, disappeared too, right along the uh, Lachine Canal. Uh, did they find who killed her? They was never did. Um, okay, they, what, year, what year was it, sorry? Uh, it's in the 80s. I was in university, 88, 89. 
Well, I mean, uh, I'm sure the police have the details, so we're just speculating, but who knows, right? Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, they did try to find a guy that they thought was involved in that particular uh, disappearance, and um, they didn't because what happened was they had somebody had been in jail and uh, their roommate was bragging that they had killed this young girl, and mm-hmm. they, they've checked it out they dragged the Lachine canal folks is is in montreal it, it was an old canal that was built um to bypass rapids that are on the shores of montreal so what they would do is they would load all these uh various boats up full of goods to get them through before the st lawrence seaway get them past the uh, the rapids and then onto the great lakes and uh, it is still there the uh, Lachine canal is about mm, 30 feet 40 50 feet wide and probably about the same deep man-made canal, and they dredged the canal looking for her remains. They couldn't find them. So it's kind of a tragic story. And when you mentioned Point St. Charles, Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in a place called Verdun, also known as Verdun in NDG. And uh, so that hit home when that happened. She was only 10 years old. And I used to uh, cycle. There's a bike path along there, and I used to cycle along there all the time. It's, you know, the interesting thing, uh, Brent, is yeah. it, it, that's going beyond serial killers. There's, there's just a lot more single incident uh, murderers, of uh, sexual murderers, than I think that we realize. You know, we, we tend to see that, uh, you know, oh, there's in this city, there's been this many victims of this type. It must be a serial killer. But there's, there really should be reasons to link that because there are people that will just, uh, for numerous reasons, once in their life, uh, they'll kill someone, you know, and, and, and for a sexual reason, and maybe they won't like it. Maybe they'll be so scared that, uh, that they never do it again. Maybe they get thrown in jail for another crime and are unable to do it, or maybe they move or die. And there's a lot of these people that commit single inc- incident uh, sex murders. So not every, it's not all of these types of murders we can uh, put down to serial killers. Okay, fair enough, folks. We're speaking with uh, Lee Miller. If you guys have any f- questions for him, the phone number, as always, is three one zero four two one four zero five three. We've only got a few minutes left. Um, his books are called Cold North Killers: Rampage, Canadian Mass Murder, and Spree Killings. And he's got a great email out called Serial Killer Quarterly. And I'll give you the URLs for that uh, on the www.nightfrightshow.com website. There you're going to find uh, all kinds of archives of all kinds of great shows that we've done over the years. This is our second week on Revolution Radio, and I'm loving it. It's a great place. I love live radio because anything can happen, and that's what I like about this show. We can go anywhere with it in and turn around and go right back in an opposite direction. And um, we're discussing serial killers tonight, as I said. And we've, Boy, uh, you know, mm-hmm. I'm looking at my notes, and there's a heck of a lot more we should cover. You'll have to come back, my friend. Uh, cannibalism, what is the attraction there? This I, I could never figure out. You know, I like a good steak myself, and I'm making life. But, you know, when you said that before we were talking about Robert Picton, that he had disposed of some of his victims in a meat factory. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. And those, uh, those pigs that ate the victims, some of them were butchered and uh, sold to people in the surrounding community. So it's sort of oh. like a, a, cannib- a, a cannibalism by proxy. I don't know what the hell you would call that. But, uh, yeah. A nightmare. Yeah, <laughs> and people people were uh, really concerned because uh, a lot of these uh, were uh, were sex workers uh, and uh, who yeah. were addicted to all manner of uh, drugs, and including you know intravenous injected drugs. And that there was concern where uh, I think it was the health minister of, of BC had to come out and say, you know, don't worry, you wouldn't have got any uh, STDs or diseases from eating this pork that where the pig had eating the prostitute. Oh, I never I, thought of that. I, I guess AIDS could be transmitted that way, couldn't it? I think that just once you found out that you had eaten that pig, that oh. all kinds of questions would arise in your mind. Yeah. You'd want to be a vegetarian real quick, I think. Um, once again, uh, I want to ask you about the psychology behind of all of this. Mm-hmm. What led you to want to do a PhD in this? 
because I wrote the books, and uh, I, the next thing I knew, I, I'd, I guess I'd done something that had never been done before, and no one had really looked at the issue of uh, Canadian serial killers at this extent. So I had uh, I'd found an, a niche, and I, though I wasn't expecting to ever be let into the, the community, they kind of, uh, through an email group, I was introduced to all kinds of people, uh, I mean, uh, famous FBI agents you would have heard of, uh, some of the world's great researchers in this, and I, I said, you know what, I can't stop here because I'm still interested, and this is an opportunity for me to to do something really unique with my life. And so I took those books and I took that cred that I had uh, from the people I was now speaking with, and I went to the university and I said, can you, I get in to do a master's degree in psychology because I'm interested in exploring this more? And they uh, said, no, you can't do a master's in psychology because you have to have a bachelor's in psychology first. And my bachelor's was, was in history. They said, but you can do the special independent program where you can take psychology courses and, cor- and, and you can combine them with o- other courses, which I picked sociology. Uh, and, and the two are great in working to explore this phenomenon. And, and the best part is, of it is, I went to, uh, to visit with someone at the university and I said, I'd like to do my master's and, and do this psychology, sociology thing on serial killers. He's like, why do you need to do your master's degree? He's like, you should just do a PhD. And I said, because I don't have a master's degree. And he said, you know what? Those books are the equivalent of a master's degree. So I actually did a direct entry PhD and I'm getting near the end of it. We've got a couple of callers we've got to get to right away. Um, first caller, can you tell us your name and your question? Oh, man, we're done. Isn't that a shame? Lee, you're going to have to come back, my friend. I want to thank you very much for joining us. www.nightfrightshow.com. There you will find the links to all the subjects we've been discussing tonight. Thanks again, Lee. All the best to you. Thanks. It, yep, if your callers want to email me, they can feel free. Thanks, buddy. Hello. 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 Am I? Hello. I can't hear. 